call the council meeting to order. Please be seated. Motion to reconvene the uh, open council meeting. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Um, proclamations. The first proclamation is from the Office of the Mayor of the City of Burnaby, Access Awareness Day. Whereas accessibility and inclusion is essential for ensuring that all community members have equity and opportunities and the ability to fully participate in community life. And whereas accessibility affects all aspects of community life, physical, social, and economic, including employment, transportation, recreation, housing, and other opportunities. And whereas we all have a role to play in ensuring that our communities are as accessible and in, as inclusive as possible. And whereas the City of Burnaby recognizes the importance of ensuring that people with disabilities have equal access to opportunities that are important to them and give their lives meaning in our community. Now therefore, I, Derek Corrigan, Mayor of Burnaby, do hereby proclaim June the 4th, 2016, as Access Awareness Day in the City of Burnaby. And we have a further proclamation from Councillor Johnson, please. Worship regarding World Oceans Week, whereas 2009, the United Nations proclaimed June 8th to be World Oceans Day each year around the world, and whereas since 1992, Canada played a key role in the United Nations recognizing World Oceans Day, and whereas World Ocean Week Canada has designated June 1st to June 8th as World Oceans Week in Canada, and whereas World Oceans Week Canada was founded to encourage all Canadians to honour, celebrate, protect and preserve our waterways and oceans as well as the habitat along and in our waterways and oceans where 80% of the oxygen we breathe is generated, and whereas World Oceans Week Canada urges all Canadians to take action to conserve water, preserve waterways and shorelines, reduce emissions, reduce their carbon footprint and protect habitat along, in, along and in our waterways. And whereas World Oceans Week Canada urges all Canadians to help our marine life recover by avoiding seafoods on the endangered list. Therefore, yourself, Mayor Derek Corrigan does proclaim, Mayor Burnaby does proclaim, the week of June 1st to 8th, 2016, as World Ocean Week in the city of Burnaby. And Thank you encourage very much. our residents to actively conserve, preserve, and protect our waterways, oceans, and habitat. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. A motion to adopt the minutes of the open council meeting held on May the 16th, 2016 been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Seeing none. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Motion to hear the delegation. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. And the delegation is Ms. Jordan Craw, and it's in regard to allegations of animal mistreatment. Ms. Craw, please come forward. Welcome to Burnaby City Council and you have 10 minutes to make your presentation. Good evening, Mayor Derek Corrigan and Council. My name is Jordan Croft and I am the founder of the Pet Habitat Project campaign. While visiting the pet store located in Metropolis at Metrotown last April, I was appalled at the conditions and the fact that we're still allowing puppies and kittens to be sold in pet stores and so I went home and created um, this project that evening. I sent in a petition late last year that um, had 270 signatures. And this, today I have another petition to present to you with 460 signatures. My goal and the reason I'm here today is to have the sale of puppies and kittens banned at Pet Habitat by having a city bylaw created. I created a Facebook page and I have 895 followers. I held a protest outside Pet Habitat on February 21st. I was out there for two hours with 10 strangers who have contacted me from my Facebook page to help support my cause. And we gained 170 signatures just by standing outside the store. Um, I would just like to state that, that Section 446 of the Criminal Code of Canada 
claims that everyone commits an offense who, being the owner or person having control of a domestic animal, willfully neglects or fails to provide suitable and adequate food, water, shelter, and care. Along with that, there's the Burnaby Animal Control Bylaw 1991, and the regulations for pet store operations are to uh, three main points I'd like to point out, are to not display a dog or cat for the sale in the store for more than 12 weeks, enclosures are sized to provide normal movement, and animals be provided with all necessary care to maintain their safety, health, and well-being. Um, recently, while in the store earlier this month, I noticed that they had dogs that were born in early November, which means that they would have come into the store at the end of January, so they have been there for quite a few months now. Um, the sized enclosures do meet only minimal standards, and they essentially look like fish tanks with only minimal air ventilation. Um, this is not suitable for a puppy or kitten. There's also, it brings their mental health into question. While I was there in May again, um, I noticed a puppy trying to escape. He was brought out into a larger caged area for viewing by people, and he got out of that. And most dogs in that situation, surrounded by other people, would be excited and want to say hi to people. This dog made a straight getaway for the door until an employee essentially tackled him and put him back where he belonged. Um, these puppies are left alone overnight. Um, the employees claim that they are brought out to exercise, but their play area is only a section behind all the cages. They get no fresh air. They don't have space for exercise. Um, they don't get enough human contact. Most of that is just people <coughs> tapping on the glass that they're in. Um, I have worked for a reputable breeder for two years, and I've worked in doggy daycares, and I know that that is not a suitable environment for a puppy. Um, in regards to the council report, the SPCA inspection of pet habitat in January uh, did conclude with a bylaw violation, a failure to provide veterinary care. A lot of comments on my Facebook page and feedback I have heard from other citizens is that they walk into the store and think all the dogs look sick. That is not necessarily always the case, but they do look sad and they're just not supposed to be there. Uh, the puppies sold at pet habitat come from an American-based company called Hunt Corporation. I emailed Hunt Corporation last April when I started the Pet Habitat Project campaign, and Michael Stolke responded. I'm not sure his role or his stance in the company, um, but he told me that he didn't have time to educate me, but proceeded to fill 10 pages with links to shelter abuse stories. He did not answer any of my questions and was very condescending. I have a copy of that email for you if you would like to see it. Uh, Mr. Stolke stated that I was welcome to come see their facility instead of, and I quote, sitting in a comfy chair making my allegations. This was a passive-aggressive response, and since Hunt Corporation doesn't actually home any of the animals itself, it's a wild goose chase to actually locate and inspect where they are all coming from. Pet Habitat claims that their puppies come from a reputable breeder, but Hunt Corporation is far from that. They are essentially the middleman between the puppy mills and pet stores. The reality is that a reputable breeder is selling to customers and homes directly. They're not selling their animals to pet stores. Uh, during my protest, when speaking with Ernest, the owner of Pet Habitat, he told me that without puppy and kitten sales, his store would not survive. Uh, that is not necessarily true, as pet stores such as PetSmart stay in business with no puppy sales, and in fact, they have recently started to adopt out cats rather than kittens. Um, the price range for puppies in pet habitat is generally $2,000 to $4,000. When a puppy is there for too long, it gets advertised for a price just under $2,000. Most purebred animals from a reputable breeder are around $1,500, maybe a little less. No animal is normally sold for that high of a price. Uh, Richmond banned the sale of puppies in pet stores back in 2010. Toronto followed suit and became Canada's second city to create a bylaw against this. There was another pet habitat chain in Coquitlam, but they got similar reviews as the one in Metrotown, <coughs> excuse me, and they closed down earlier this year. I have no problem with this pet store staying in business. I just don't think that they should be able to sell puppies and kittens, and that's why I'm proposing a bylaw, and I'm using them as an example. Uh, in conclusion, a pet store is not a suitable environment for a puppy or kitten, <coughs> excuse me regardless if current regulations are followed. We should be encouraging people to buy directly from a reputable breeder or adopt instead. The selling of puppies and kittens in pet stores perpetuates the puppy mill industry. The likelihood of pet habitat and other pet stores getting their
very high as reputable breeders sell directly to families. With all the recent SPCA seizures in the Lower Mainland, it's just proof that we need to one by one break down the cycle. Not only are the puppies most likely coming from a mill, but once they are in the pet store, they are confined in an inadequate environment that severely decreases their quality of life. Thank you, Mayor Derek Corgan and Burnaby Council for giving me this opportunity today. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Croft, for making your presentation to City Council and for all of your uh, personal interest in this issue. Uh, Councillor Dollywall, you have a question or a comment? Yes, uh, Your Worship, thank you very much. Ms. Crofton, thank you for making the time to be here. Um, appreciate uh, your persistent diligence uh, just on behalf of the animals, obviously. Um, a question for you. Do you still work with the uh, a breeder uh, uh, of animals? I do not. I am right now pursuing my career in youth justice. Uh, this was when I lived in Grand Forks. I am still in contact with this, um, with my... So you don't, employer, you're, not, you're not a breeder yourself? You not don't currently. work for breeders? Oh, okay. Just wanted to make sure that was uh, clear. Um, I agree with the presentation, and, and uh, you know we have gone through a, a bylaw review a couple of years ago. That was the result where we made some changes, and some of these things were, were with the intentions of making sure the animals were at least somewhat comfortable during the time they stay there. But it does appear to be that, that the store is negligent here and there, as you can see from the report. Have you received the report? No, you might not have seen this report. We have a report in front of the council. Do you have a copy? I do, yes. Okay. So you know they, they were fined this year earlier, but that's just one uh, fraction. But we never know whether, you know, at the time when uh, how, how the, the animals are uh, are looked after. I do believe that uh, the, the space they provide to the animal is not adequate. It, it isn't just enough, it doesn't matter because the space is so limited in these stores, they can't really provide adequate space. And, and, and since they're not always open, they can't always give the care that a breeder can provide. So I, um, I personally believe I, uh, that, that it is uh, uh, not necessary uh, for the pets to be sold because they are available from reputable breeders who look after their animals m much better. They are better raised animals have, uh, as they grow, they generally cannot, uh, they don't have that kind of a, uh, a stress that they're living with because that's very important. So, so I, I support your, your um, uh, petition to the city. And I imagine um, uh, some down, sometimes down the road, the council will probably take another look at at the review at the bylaw animals bylaw and, and we will discuss that again uh, to see whether the time has indeed come to, uh, to ban the sales of kittens and puppies we'll continue to monitor in the meantime and i just want to say thank you for being here and uh, and see how um, we get response from uh, public as part of this uh, your presentation and uh, based on that, we'll, we'll take the next steps. Thank you. Councillor Jordan. Again, and thank you, Ms. Kropp, for your persistence. <laughs> um, I think one of the reasons that I supported previously with our bylaw review continuing to uh, the sale of the animals that at, at least we could put in requirements and have those requirements enforced for the care of those animals which is something that was not available um, by any sort of provincial legislation at the time that we did this bylaw. And I, I understand now that the province is going to have um, regulatory requirements for, for breeders. And again, that was one of my concerns that people, do, you know, go on Craigslist, they don't know what they're buying, there's no regulation, there's no inspection, there's nothing protecting um, those animals. In those situations, at least we have a process uh, for this one uh, store that we have in our city. So, so I wonder if you have any comment about the new provincial regulations and what what impact that that may have um, on the care of on the care of animals in the broader sense and and you know the relationship between the sale of and in that realm through breeders that are regulated and licensed, et cetera, versus versus the pet stores. 
Mm, I think my only <coughs> comment would be that I just believe in dealing with the breeder directly and knowing where your animals come from. And even though there, some are sold through Craigslist, people have the opportunity to go to the home, see where the animal is kept, where, who the parents are, have all of that, as opposed to being handed a piece of paper. Um, I know Pet Habitat does provide the information, but it's again, it's information they can't stand behind because they don't get it from a breeder themselves like they claim to. They get it from Hunt Corporation, and Hunt Corporation is an American-based company. And when I spoke with them, he didn't seem to realize what store I was talking about or that I was in Canada, and that kind of concerned me. He was mostly focusing on American. So it's just hard to know exactly what they're in business with, and I believe that I just, I just don't think the pet store is a suitable environment no matter what you do. They need to be outside. They need fresh air. I have a friend in Maple Ridge whose mom breeds animals, and she only breeds her... Uh, she bred her family dog three times and then had her neutered before she was um, too old and she didn't want to overbreed her and the puppy is already like less than two months old and they're outside, they're getting fresh air, they're socialized with, with each other and they're growing up to n know what it's like to be in a family, not in a box. Thank you. Councillor Johnson. Thank you. <coughs> uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I uh, strongly support the uh, elimination of pet stores um, for, for dog, dog and cats. Um, I know um, myself, I used to go into the store at Metrotown to pick up, uh, or, and others, to pick up um, supplies, dog food, toys, whatever. And when you see the, the puppies sitting in pools of urine, that's pretty disgusting. I and mean, you can tell some of them have been there for quite a while. Um, Councillor. Uh, Jordan's comment about uh, the regulation, I think that's, that's great. I think there already is some, the, some of the, uh, the kennel clubs, the American Kennel Club, Canadian Kennel Club. They have require the breeders to keep genetic information on, on the dogs that they're breeding. So I think that's a real positive too. Um, I can't say it takes a bit more than two of us to make a change to a, motion, to a, a bylaw, so uh, we'll have to see what others have to say. But I. Again, I uh, commend you for coming today, and thank you. Thank you. Councillor Valco. Well, I got in late on this one, but uh, I just wanted you to expand a little on, you, you made a comment about, uh, you were referencing the criminal code or something about displaying animals in shop windows or something. What, what, what were you, what, what exactly were you talking about there? Sorry, I quoted the criminal code of conduct and then I also quoted the regulations for pet operations as of the current bylaw and state by Burnaby and that was that puppies are not to be displayed in a store for longer than 12 weeks. So and that's in the council report that I got as well and when I was there I saw puppies that were born in November and they come right when they can which is eight weeks of age so if you look at that one born in November 9 would have came early January. So already it's been there for over the time it should be, but during that SPCA investigation in January, they wouldn't have known that. And, uh, yeah. So, so that's our regulation. <coughs> that's the, that's, that's yours, under, yes. That's our regulation about the length of time that, a, that one dog can be displayed in yes. public view in the window there. Yes, and it also raises a concern. Um, I and other customers of the store, well, sorry, I'm not a customer. I've never bought anything from there. But citizens in the area have asked employees what happens to an animal if it's not sold, if it is there too long. And all the employers have to say is that's never an issue. They're always sold. And I had someone come up to me and tell me that uh, he noticed a few puppies who had been there for quite a while, and then one day they were all just gone at the same time. Well, again, thanks for... Uh clarifying that for me and uh, it's funny how this issue has evolved over the years I remember years ago one of the most popular songs I think was Patty Page how much is that doggy in the window now we don't even want the doggies in the window so so uh, yeah your persistence is uh, exemplary and I, I agree I you know I think the time has come where unfortunately the uh, the provincial government maybe wasn't completely uh, fulsome in the regulations they brought in in order to be able to stop you know, puppy mills using intermediaries like Hunt Corporation and then bringing the animals in here. 
should have brought in a more wide-ranging uh, provincial legislation. So, anyways, um, I don't disagree with, with uh, what you're saying. Hopefully, when we uh, when we do our review again sooner rather than later, we can put a stop to the practice. And I really don't think the the argument that uh, these pet stores are going to go out of business because of, of a lack of cat, you know, cat or dog sales. I think that's probably one of the weakest arguments they've got. So thanks again for coming. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate you coming in and talking to us about this issue. Long drive in from Maple Ridge to come to Burnaby City Council, but we appreciate the attention you've focused on the issue over the past couple of years. I think that uh, everyone around the council table is concerned about ensuring that animals are treated properly in our city, whether it's animals that are kept by our residents or animals that are put up for sale through the uh, stores like Pet Habitat or whether it's our treatment of animals as a city through our SPCA. So we're very conscious of that issue and uh, I think in the initial stage very much council was looking at ensuring that if there was access to sale of animals through a pet store that it was regulated and that we were careful about uh, exactly how it was conducted but it's obvious some councillors are more sympathetic now to your position which is that there shouldn't be a, an allowable sale at all. I uh, was talking to one of the councillors earlier and saying that uh, there is a great desire still for people to be able to own pets, to own dogs and to own cats and in fact my son and uh, daughter-in-law um, got themselves a dog and uh, that dog was imported from California. Um, more and more we're seeing dogs being brought in from Mexico, from all over the world into Canada which is again another issue that I think all of us have to be aware of is that we're not necessarily breeding enough animals or even turning in enough animals to support the people who want to have pets here in, in Canada. We're in fact uh, importing um, <coughs> refugee dogs and cats to Canada to try to provide um, the animals that people are seeking. And, uh, and so it, it is interesting that in fact this has been the way, the development of the way uh, we're, we're dealing with this. And I think part of it I remember when I was a kid is that almost everybody had a cat that was having kittens and they were trying to give out kittens to everybody else in their neighborhood but now because the animals are neutered or spayed very early on it's a limited amount of animals that are actually productive and creating new families so we're seeing a paucity of, uh, of animals available to families and, uh, and I guess I think the most optimistic thing I've seen is the fact that uh, the provincial government's asserting itself to protect the animals as far as breeders are concerned because I think all of us would be very much more confident if we knew that there was a, an aggressive regulatory program in regard to breeders and that families who may go out to get a dog from someone who's a breeder knew that it was working under a regulatory environment that protected the animals there too. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. One of the managers' report be brought forward. Yeah, can bring that item forward. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. And I move the recommendation of item one of the manager's report. Been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? Opposed? And carried. Thank you again, Ms. Croft. All right. Um, We are now moving on to reports, a motion to resolve into a committee of the whole. It's been moved and seconded. Is there a seconder? All those in favor, opposed and carried. The first report is from the Executive Committee of Council. Councillor Dollywell, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, on behalf of the Executive Committee, I move the following recommendations. Number one, 1620 is, uh, is a grant in the amount of 28,000 to be awarded to Burnaby Community Services for core programs and publications in 2016. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, opposed, carry. 1626, that a grant in the amount of $17,000 be awarded to Burnaby Family Life and Sport of Services provided by the organization. Moved and seconded. Seeing no discussion. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Number 1627, 
recommendation, first recommendation is that a grant in the amount of $1,000 be awarded to the Montecito Elementary School for travel expenses for Team Odyssey of the mine members to participate at the World Finals on May 25, 2016 in Ames, Iowa. And, and sorry, and the second is a grant in the amount of $1,000 awarded to the Buckingham Elementary, uh, Elementary School for travel expenses for Team Odysseys of the mine members to participate at the World Finals and on the same date, May 25, 2016 in Ames, Iowa. It's been moved and seconded. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, opposed, carry. Item 1628, uh, that an in-kind grant for a green fee waiver up to the amount of 1,200 be awarded to the Burnaby Civic Employees Union for the QP Local 23 Open Golf Tournament on June 4th at Burnaby Mountain Golf Course. Second. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor, opposed, carry. Item 1629 is a crisis intervention and suicide prevention center for BC. Your Worship, the recommendation is that this grant request be denied. Moved and seconded. Discussion. All those in favor, opposed, carry. 1630 is that a grant in the amount of $1,000 be awarded to Burnaby Girls Soccer Club U15 Blaze for travel expenses for 11 Burnaby players to attend the Provincial B Cup Tournament on July 7, 2016 in Penticton. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor, opposed, carry. And item 1631, Burnaby Districts Youth Soccer Association of Worship. Uh, the committee has requested that this matter be referred to Parks, Recreation, and Culture Commission for, for consideration. Been moved and seconded. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, opposed, and carried. Thank, Thank you very you much, Councillor Dollywell. Financial Management Committee, Councillor Johnson. Uh, I would move that Council authorize staff to amend the Solid Waste and Recycling Bylaw 12875 as outlined in Section 2 of the report. Second. Your Worship, the uh, report, um, Council will remember a few months back uh, the City uh, initiated a process to initiate the legalization of secondary suites. The report that's before us this evening uh, um, sets up some recoveries for some costs that are related to that. Right, you ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed, and carry. Next item, Your Worship, regarding uh, 2016 Engineering Capital Infrastructure Traffic Management. I would move that Council approve the capital expenditure of $2.071 million for roadwork capital improvements as outlined in the report and that Council authorize staff to bring down the capital reserve bylaw in the amount of $2,167,800 inclusive of GST to finance capital projects as outlined in the report. These are for traffic management capital items. LED street lighting conversion phase for 2017 is in order. The lights this year so that installation can happen in early 17. This will also allow the third phase to qualify for a BC Hydro Grant. Question. Questions called. All those in favor, Oppose. carry. Uh, next item, Your Worship, uh, also regarding engineering capital infrastructure, I would move that Council approve the capital expenditures of 962000 for vehicle acquisitions as outlined in the report and that Council authorize staff to bring down a capital reserve by law in the amount of $1,007,000 inclusive of GST to finance capital programs as outlined in the report. And Your Worship, this, this is uh, for two new excavators and two new tandem axle dump trucks that will be equipped with a blade and sander for s winter snow clearing operations. They'll provide each of the water and sewer construction crews a dedicated excavator and dump truck to improve construction, especially close down at the end of the day, and to reduce reliance on hired equipment. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, carried. And next, Your Worship, uh, regarding also engineering capital infrastructure, I move that Council approve the capital expenditure of $1.465 million for road work capital improvements and the Council authorized staff to bring down the Capital Reserve Bylaw in the amount of $1,533,500 inclusive of GST to finance capital programs is all in the report. Your Worship, these are uh, 2016 projects uh, as to the provisional capital budget. Uh, these are now updated bylaw funding requests based on the detailed design 
and the increased scope of some projects, the early birds that are coming in with higher prices due to a busier construction market, and we're experiencing a 20 to 30 percent increase in bidding prices. Houses, uh, the cost of, of uh, real estate in Greater Vancouver is driving up everything in relation to uh, the pricing of good. That's not good news. It's not. All right. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Also, Your Worship, regarding uh, engineering capital infrastructure, I would move that Council approve the capital expenditure of 771570 for water and sewer infrastructure programs as outlined in the report, and the Council authorize staff to fund from the Waterworks Capital Utility Fund the amount of 12100 inclusive of GST, and to fund from the Sanitary Sewer Fund the amount of 795500 inclusive of GST to finance capital programs as outlined in this report. This is uh, also the update, the provisional capital that was raised in December to account for some scope changes and relating to co additional costs we were, we're get, getting from BC Hydro. All right. All those in favor, opposed, and carry. And then lastly, Your Worship, uh, 2017 Engineering Capital Infrastructure Bylaw, and this Council approved the capital expenditure of $4.615 million for infrastructure programs as outlined in the report, and the Council authorized staff to bring down a capital reserve bylaw in the amount of $3,276,300 inclusive of GSP and draw from the Sanitary Sewer Capital Fund in the amount of 811300 inclusive of GST and the Waterworks Capital Utility Fund for the amount of 743200 to finance capital projects as outlined in the report. And Your Worship, this is, uh, this is for additional um, projects in relation to uh, engineering projects such as pump stations, uh, sanitary sewers and various small ticket items. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Worship, is being worried that we are meeting again next week or anything <laughs> like that? I don't know. He blew through $10 million pretty quick there. <laughs> engineering week. Yeah. You want the detail? You want an engineering report just as long as planning reports? You're getting them. <laughs> <laughs> There's no money left for planning or parks. All right, we will move on to the city manager's report. We've already dealt with item one. I'll move to item two, which this is emergency backup power for traffic signals, and this provides information regarding the resiliency of the city's traffic signals during a power outage. Councillor Jordan. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I would move the recommendation to receive the report, if that hasn't been done. <laughs> and I just had uh, a question. Is this it, the report's intention? It says just receive it for information, but it, is it the staff's intention to proceed with the work under 2.1, that is, the upgrading the um, UPS to 100, for 160,000 this year? Is that is is that covered in the capital plan already, or what am I missing? Mr. Gauss. <laughs> yes, we intend to continue, but this will be under the capital contingency, so it was not in the capital plan, but because it's under 250,000, it doesn't need approval from council, oh, but it will come huh. under capital contingency. We started this uh, summer, unlikely to be totally completed, just the delivery and order of so many uh, UPS units will just take a little while, but we'll start installing uh, into some, in, from summer into early next year. Ah, okay. So, um, yes, indeed, I support this, and I, I thank uh, for following up on this because, as, as everyone is aware, Council was really concerned after the big wind last summer uh, about mediating the potential impacts into the future, and this, this whole area of uh, traffic Street lights was a real major concern and a real uh, serious safety risk at the time. So I, I uh, certainly support what we're doing, but I would like perhaps to have maybe a longer 
conversation through the Financial Management Committee about some additional options or some of the detail of this report. So I support this report going forward, but maybe we arising and could refer it back to the FMC to I think we should get more than one extra generator, for example. But I don't know how much they got, so I don't want to make a motion here now. Ten million wasn't enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, how many street lights do we have? <laughs> Seventy intersections. <laughs> so I think maybe more than one extra generator would be good, but I did not willing to make an amendment at this point. <laughs> I'm very careful with these kind of issues at this time of year. As, uh, any implications for the tax draw are always <laughs> make me nervous. So we'll have a look at it. You, uh, are you ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Oh, I don't know if Councillor Dollywell was on this or... Oh, sorry, Councillor Dollywell. Um, yes, Your Worship, uh, no, just a couple of small um, questions. One, um, so what happens, uh, uh, I guess this is to the Director of Engineering, so we have up to 70 uh, existing uh, intersections where we have UPS, which is of Class A, let's call it Class A. Now we're going to have 16 new ones which would be, let's call Class B. Um, once most of them are eight hours, the, uh, sorry, four hours, previous ones, right? And the new ones, I believe, we are going to 24 hours flat, uh, regular, <coughs> regular function. Is that correct? Your Worship, no, they, they all, all these UPSs will have a similar performance. What you're seeing is just the difference on when full functioning, so they all will be full functioning for the four hours, then they go into flashing mode thereafter for, for up to 24 hours after the incidents. So, so even the first 70, which are the high priority areas, have a similar performing UPS. And we, through capital, we ultimately replace those periodically, right, because they, they do take some, uh, some replacement over time. So all, all of the... 86 in the end will be the similar G, uh, UPSs on, on, on those intersections with, with so, similar performance. So I think my question arose out of a misunderstanding of saying these ones that we're proposing would be $9,500 more than the, than the other ones. No, Your Worship, that's just an additional 9500 a year in maintenance costs. So that's just for the additional 16 based on the maintenance oh, cost okay. of the other 70. Uh, that will have an operating cost impact of 9600 for the additional 16 because right now we don't have those 16, so the minute we have them, that's just for a little bit of maintenance and putting some money toward a replacement cost. Okay, yeah. I'm with you now then. So, so the $20,000 each, that was previous cost, is very similar to the ones for, for the 16 as well? That's correct, George. Okay, so uh, when you say there's an option capable of going 24 hours, what's the cost of those? Yeah, Your, Your Worship, that, that, that is the 20000 because the others are actually cheaper. But realistically, they, I mean, you have to add additional real estate, if you like. And that was one of the other reasons, other than cost, that we, we, we stay away from them. If you look at the statistical analysis, those don't come into action very often. And essentially, each light, if you take all 86, to have a second unit, which is really what it means, it's got a second operating box as well. So it's a bit more real estate on every intersection corner, uh, box at ground level, and, uh, and it's far more expensive. And we just, if you give the statistical analysis, despite that one storm event, once you go over 24 hours, you know, there's really not a lot of systems out there other than generators that are going to truly help you well enough. So that's the reason it got rejected, is just the additional okay. cost plus the actual, you know, the, the space taken at each intersection where you have it is All right. now well, being not right. worth the extra time. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. So the, the, and the other thing, the other question was that one generator you were asking, um, what's that going to do us for the whole city? Like, what's if somebody's going to just run from light to light, light yes. to light, what's the story? So, Your Worship, I think, I think what you see in the report is that on the whole, we do not intend on a big outage, i.e. citywide, a bit like you had, to have generators. That's just not practical. We have 250 intersections. The 86 that you see are multi-lane intersections where we say four-way stop procedures do not work. 
we really, if you think of operationally, when, when we have such a big outage to go fill 86 generators with gas while you're trying to keep buildings running and all the rest of it is really not a good operational procedure. The single generators we buy are really for planned outages or small outages that we find through the rest of the year. So you have a single intersection going down or we're busy doing some work close by where you've got power outage. We will put the generator onto that. So those are really single intersection issues where we, where we expect that outage to go longer than the four hours. <coughs> we will put that one generator that we have. We now have one. This is be a second one. We use those for single event or single intersection outages that we expect to go longer than the four hours. And that can be maintenance reasons or a, a point outage. But we certainly do not recommend that once you go to any wide outage to try and cover that issue with generators. It's just not practical. All right, but I think the issue that uh, Councillor Jordan was asking is that, uh, well, we have one, would having a few be a little, a little more cautious in regard to having outages maybe at one or two or three places at the same time? We know we can't cover with generators all of our lights, but there may be reason for you to consider additional capacity in the future. and. Uh, that issue, I think, is properly with financial management to be able to look at the, the issue and uh, the broader one of how long we should uh, extend this is one. I think uh, you should sit down and have a talk with the financial management committee about that issue too is, you know, what is the, the best practices in regard to cities looking after um, emergencies and, and trying to protect themselves against emergencies. I know that uh, We've often had that issue arise that we don't have that good a snow clearing equipment because we typically don't have that much snow. And so keeping equipment for an extended period of time means that we're going to have equipment that isn't properly utilized and we're not getting the worth out of. Uh, on the other hand, they have very good equipment in places like Toronto. And, uh, and so we get compared sometimes to the way they snow clear in other jurisdictions. but. You don't get really good and well equipped at it if you're not doing it very often. And so I, I want to be, this is an area where I think it's very important that we, we make sure that we're, we're following best practices and that we understand what the best practices are. Director Jordan? Uh, so, so thank you, Your Worship. I would like to refer this topic or, or the report to the Financial Management Committee for further discussion. Second motion. And just one thing, I remember, I recall at uh, looking up information about this last fall when we initially started to look at it and, you know, the USA thing, people are much more litigious and likely to sue and things, right? So in cities in the States, um, if the lights go out at the traffic intersection, the city gets sued because it's their fault that there was a traffic accident. So they have, they have semi-trailers full of backup generators for when the lights go out to keep their lights working. So not, not that I'm encouraging us to become more litigious, but you know, some people could say that there's a liability to us in these circumstances too. So, so I think we, you know, we do have a responsibility to look at that and also ICBC might want to help finance this because of the cost of the amount of accidents that occurred last year at those kind of intersections is also a significant thing. So I think there's some more avenues for us to look at. But I appreciate this recommendation coming forward. I think, um, I think probably we'll try to look at Canadian cities. I don't think we have reached the American level of litigiousness yet. And uh, I think the Canadian courts remain significantly more sensible in regard to apportioning liability. But uh, the point is taken that Really, the issue, more than whether we can get sued, is whether we're doing a good job of looking after our citizens in an emergency. That's really the key, I think. All right, you ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Um, item 6.3, that's the community school grant. And Second the motion. This is to request council authorization for the execution of an agreement with the Burnaby School District for the support and operation of eight community schools. And this, in fact, is a uh, big contribution from the city, almost $500,000. It helps keeps our community schools going, but it's a 
cooperative work with the school board and with the provincial government and uh, I know that our community schools do a tremendous job of uh, providing a wide range of programming in different communities across Burnaby and I was looking at the list you know everything from bike clubs to movie nights to gym time and Lego Lego clubs and uh, clay works and community barbecues family education uh, workshops and sharing culture, community dinners, great salmon send-off. There is just a wide range of activities that are held in our schools after school hours and that's what community <coughs> schools are for. So it adds another community center in a neighborhood to be able to have a community school. You ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed and carried. This is to request Council bring forward a Burnaby Recreation Fees and Admissions Bylaw with additional updates to uh, charges for outdoor pool rental and student filming in parks. Questions, Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item 5. This is to request Council bring forward a bylaw to appropriate $421,830 from capital reserves to finance four projects in parks, recreation, and cultural services. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Um, item six. This is a request that Council bring down a capital reserves bylaw in the amount of $392,500 to finance three projects. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Item seven. This is to obtain council approval to award a contract for civil engineering consultant services to assist the city in developing a stormwater and flood analysis program for the Big Bend area. Question. Seconder, please. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Item 8. Well, this is a good one. This is the Willington Linear Park and this is to obtain council approval toward a contract for the services of a civil engineering consultant to assist in the design and construction services for the Willington Linear Park. Questions called? We're on our way. All those in favor, opposed and carried. Item 9. This is to obtain council approval toward a contract for the civil consulting services to design and provide construction administration <laughs> services related to the Fraser River Foreshore Dyke Reach 8 project. Councillor Valka. Uh, no big question on it, but uh, uh, I, I'm always intrigued by these reports, especially the report that's come to Metro Vancouver in regards to uh, potential future flooding. But what exactly is Dyke Reach 8? Where is this? That's, uh, that's going from, uh, I'm just trying to think, my, so you're going upriver really. We, we started further downriver and each reach has just been an annual program as we've moved upriver. These are one of the last ones actually before we can close off the area at least that from our, our area is a concern. We've had one little area where we've had some issues with the railways, trying to get permission from them to access their property. So with the exception of that one area, this will essentially complete that reach. Of, of dikes. So all we did was is really, if you walk along on top of the dikes, they were just arbitrarily chopped up into uh, reasonable project sizes, and this is just number eight of those. I'm not sorry I asked that question. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Item 10. This is to obtain council approval to award a contract for the structural rehabilitation and seismic retrofit of the Low Heat Highway Bridge R20. Councillor Daliwal. Your Worship, just wanted to know what's R20, Bridge R20. Where is it? <laughs> Must be somewhere that I don't see, but what's Bridge R20? Where is this? Bridge Where goes? That, that is a good question. It's just past Gilardi. So going toward, uh, you know, toward uh, the, the Portman Bridge, just just past Gilardi Road. Oh, yes. Yeah. There is a bridge, after all. I was trying to figure all night last night, where is the bridge on Low Heat Highway? Well, now we know. There you go. The R20. You ready for the question? 
All those in favor, opposed, and carried. See, you get to learn something every time you come to council. Item 11. This is Combined Sewer Separation Package 6, the Albert Lane. And this is uh, to award a contract. You ready? Ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed, carried. Yeah, seconder. All right, now let's, okay, this is, okay, we're going to go back to this. Is that we move it, we second it, then you can call the question, okay? I don't know, I've lost control. All right, uh, item 12. This is to obtain council approval to award extensions to two contracts for the supply and delivery of Portland cement concrete. Question. Questions have been called. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. And don't be asking why we're getting our concrete from Portland. <laughs> <laughs> Item 13. This is a two high-rise apartment towers with ground-oriented live-work townhouses in the Brentwood Town Center plan. And this is authorization to forward to a public hearing on June the 28th. Second a motion. Councillor Jordan. Just briefly, was to, I was interested to see in this um, particular proposal uh, a, another new twist from what our planning department has managed to negotiate with the developer, and that is in exchange for some relatively small one-bedroom units, the developer has agreed to increase the number of larger two-bedroom and three-bedroom units in the so we have the, basically the same square footage in the tower, but we have some smaller one bedrooms for affordability, and, but also answering the uh, call for additional three bedroom units for families. So, so in another creative solution, so we're not legislating, you must have 10%, you know, three bedrooms, but we're working with the developers to come up with a variety of options for the kind of accommodations that people are seeking. So. So I think that's a, a novel thing and uh, appreciate the work that was come towards that and the architect and developer agreeing to go along with that. So we're going to have 36, 26 three-bedroom units in this building. And that's um, a subject I've talked to the uh, development community about on a number of occasions because it, uh, it also reflects their changing marketplace. Um, they are saying that more and more families are choosing uh, high-rise development to raise their families and looking to, uh, to have two-bedroom units and uh, three-bedroom units for, to be able to house a complete family. So it is a, a real difference and one that um, even has been accommodated by putting two regular units together by some people. So it is a change and uh, I think more and more people are now seeing um, the high density living in town centers to be good for their families as well for well as for individuals and uh, and people who are empty nesters so we're seeing a change you ready for the question all those in favor opposed and carried item 14 this is the installation of a rooftop antenna facility and this is to forward to an, a public hearing on June the 28th Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Item 15 is uh, rezoning applications. I think we are going to be on individual items on this one. So we don't get to move them anymore as a, as a package. All right, uh, let me catch up to you right here. Is it item one is 4350 uh, Still Creek Drive, and this is to permit installation of a sky, tri a sky sign on the west building of an existing two building office complex. And uh, this is to authorization to work with the applicant. All right, you ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item two. 
This is 30, 3737 Canada Way, 3748 North, Norfolk Street, and abutting Lane right of way and Esmond Avenue Road right of way. This is construction of a low rise apartment development, and this involves the sale of uh, city owned land, a highway closure bylaw, and authorization to work with the applicant. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item 3. This is uh, 7447 and 7453 14th Avenue. This is to permit construction of a townhouse development with underground parking. And this is to uh, send to a neighboring property owner and also authorization to work with the applicant towards a suitable plan of development. Question. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Item 4. This is from R3 residential to R3A residential uh, district. This is uh, 4095 Edinburgh Street. And uh, this is to allow a greater floor area on the particular piece of property due to a larger size. And this is to continue to work with the applicant towards a suitable plan of development. <coughs> Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item 5. This is construction of a three-story townhouse development with four units at 420, 422 Delta Avenue. And this is authorization to uh, work with the uh, applicant and also to send a notice to 4908 Hastings Street. Councillor Calandino. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just a question to start through you. The area on Hastings uh, east of Delta generally RM3, uh, sorry, RM3. Two, right, and this is moving down to RM2 or RM1. Let me read carefully. Um, it's RM3, mostly. It's RM3, right? Yeah. But and they're asking for RM2, which is a downgrading. Of, is that because the lot is not large enough? It relates to the size of the lot for RM3 versus RM2 development. Okay. So. If uh, there is uh, the other lot next door that we had here about four or five years ago, which had a commercial area in the ground floor, which never actually developed, the building is rented in, the, I think it's 48 or 9. Um, that has also a, a half empty lot next to it. If uh, there was a consolidation of the two, then they could have an RM3. Through your, your worship, I'd need to confirm the lot areas for the two lots that they met the minimum. But if they did meet the minimum of the district, then it could go to RM3. The minimum would be what? Minimum is uh, 17,976 square feet. And this current one is about 9,400. Yeah. So if the two are equal in size, then it would meet the minimum. And does staff know whether this uh, developer has approached? the uh, owners of 4908 for purchasing to consolidate? Yes, they have. Yeah. And no success? Not as yet. All right. You ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Item 6. This is 9050 University High Street, and this is to uh, permit a 50 space child care facility. And uh, this is authorization to work with the applicant. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item 7. This is a portion of 7550 Rosewood Street and 7126, 72. 10 72 16 Mary Avenue and this is to permit development of a new seniors complex care facility and a future seniors mid-rise apartment building authorization to work towards a suitable plan of development questions, questions called all those in favor opposed carried item 8 this is 8940 University Crescent, and this is to permit development of a 13-story multiple-family residential building with two-story townhouses at its base, and this is authorization to work towards a suitable plan of development. Questions, Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item 9.
This is 4828 and 4874 Low Heat Highway. This is to permit the construction of two high-rise buildings atop the underground and structured parking as phase uh, 1B of the Woodlands site development. And this is authorization to work with the applicant. <coughs> Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. That completes the city manager's report. A motion to rise and report. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Motion the uh, report of the committee be adopted. All those in, fa in favor, opposed, and carried. Um, oh, I didn't deal with the deferred matter. Does council want to deal with the deferred matter tonight? You ready? I think it's on table. It's been deferred to uh, to this council meeting. Was it moved at the last meeting? It was. Yes. Yeah, moved it and then tabled it. All right. So it's been moved and seconded, deferred to this meeting. It's now before you. Are you ready for the question? I'll, oh, sorry, Councillor Johnson. Just briefly, briefly, Your Worship, we didn't, I didn't mention uh, much about it last week. Uh, this is. Uh, uh, a report would authorize the establishment of pay-by-phone parking in the city. Uh, we would look at the ability of, of, similar to some of our neighboring municipalities, where you can uh, actually use a, an app on your phone that would enable you to, uh, to um, pay, pay for your parking as opposed to having to have uh, loonies or toonies in your pocket to put into the, to the meeting. All right. Councillor Dollywell. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, uh, just first of all, question, are the recommendations in front of us, Your Worship, the report? Yeah, it is. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I, I can understand, Your Worship, the, the thrust of the report. It's been 18 years since uh, the rate's been reviewed. Uh, a lot of things have changed, other costs have gone up, and I believe uh, the traffic patterns have changed as well. So I think it's a good time to review. I, uh, I do have uh, uh, some sympathy for changing rates uh, because I believe it's a tool that's used to, uh, to manage uh, if, if length of time parking is, is, is reasonable for a neighborhood. It also uh, pays for itself for us installing the meters, clearing meters, etc., right, and, and also make some money for the city. Uh, but most importantly, it's in response to the businesses in the areas where these meters are located. Uh, so I, uh, my question, my not question, my concerns with the report, Your Worship, is uh, two or twofold. One, the, the rate itself, while it needs adjusting uh, to $2, is, is, is a bit high for the entire city uh, because we believe there are some areas which are utilized, some are not utilized properly, but more importantly, there are some places where we don't think it's appropriate to raise rates that much significantly, and there may be some areas in the city where I think this, I would urge the staff to really take a closer look rather than a blanket change to two dollars first and then worry about see where we shouldn't. I'd rather see the rates stay but introduced to two dollars only to the areas or dollar fifty as the report says could be any combination between one dollar to two dollars i believe if it is then it should be to see where it's warranted to go to dollar fifty or two dollars which isn't clear i believe at this point although that's the route that the the staff wants to take but i think it's important to leave areas like burnaby hospital and some other sensitive areas to where they are now before we add anything to it. And I believe that's where the report is going, although it isn't uh, particularly uh, indicated in this report. So I'd like to have that one, first of all, uh, understood and, and clarified with the staff that minimum, currently $1 rate is fine, but when you go to two, good deliberations before, rather than saying, let's start with two and then see where we should really bring it down to buck fifty, depending on the use of it. That's how I read this report. So I like to have that change to a point to say, no, we're going to keep one fifty, uh, one dollar, but raise two dollars, <coughs> fifty or two dollars where we think it's warranted. 
So take time to, to decide that. I, be, I would be supportive of that. The second part with this report really is called Pay Phone Parking Program. And, and that too is also, uh, I think, warranted. Uh, many cities have gone to that. There's a demand for that. And I think it's a convenience of these days when people are walking around with, with phones, they don't have change. So that seems to be the way to go. Um, at the same time, I wouldn't want the staff to start to think that this is the only way to go. And the report is clear on that one because the meter with the coin cash should continue because most people are still using coins. Uh, they want to get away with a loony or a toonie because they know the time they want to put in and that's what they want to use. So, so, so these meters, I assume, would take, continue to take coins as well as people use pay phone to really have a time extended on that particular meter for that vehicle as such. I, I don't know the technology, it's not been elaborated here, but I assume there's some way to do that, that you're parking certain, uh, a specific one particular vehicle for that long and only that long, that vehicle is good to stay. Any other vehicle parked afterwards would be ticketed because if they haven't paid. So I imagine that Paul looked after it's not, doesn't go into this and I'm not, that's not a concern for me, but the concern here, what the report suggests is that that it will be up to $80,000 to $200,000 per year, depending on the frequency of usage, <coughs> what would cost the city annually to accommodate pay phone, by pay by phone. And that's where my concern is. I don't see for the people who are going to make an effort to use their coins and take care of the coins to pay, to subsidize that a convenience of people using that pay phone. So I, and the report suggests that it will pay for itself. Everything will pay for itself if you eventually if you're going to subsidize from one to the other because everybody else is paying $2. How do you justify that whether $2 is the real rate or we're putting a 20 cents out of that one towards the pay phones? So I, I'm really opposed to that. I believe the person who carries that phone, perhaps pays somewhere close to $150 a month anyway for paying the privileges of those phones, they can darn well pay just whatever the 30, 50 cents are going to be for exchange using that, that transaction. I think that's the way the banks are. You go to a bank, you charge, use that ATM, guess what? You get 30 cents when you pay for that fee because that's the cost of doing that transaction. That's not charged to everybody who owns that, who works with that bank to pay for the convenience of other people using that ATM. It's the user of the ATM who pays. And so I have a, a concern with this report. Since there's no way me, me to as the amend this report, perhaps the only way I can do is to, to oppose and, and vote against this report. Unless there was a way for me to, at, at this point, your worship, to say that I would mo like to modify this report to say that, that the, the payment of telephone by, pay, by phone will be the responsibility of the user if the, the provider of that service, whatever that is, should be directly passed to that, the user of that pay phone. I recognize the staff believes that they have looked at other systems and other cities. Some of them charge, some of them don't charge. The experience may be good or bad. But regardless of what happens in the cities, I do not believe in, in hours, uh, some of the citizens who will be using this, these, phone, these pay phone, I mean parking, pay parking, to be subsidizing that. I, the other reason for this one is, I think, because most of the time, people who are using <coughs> these machines, obviously meters, they, they are doing some kind of, a, obviously, business. Uh, some of these are people who may be uh, on fixed income, but they got to use it. They got to take their patients to doctors, etc. So you have meter parking, but here you are. You're using yourself for 15, 20 minutes, but you are paying for something like $200,000 a year that eventually is done on behalf of the of of of, of these people. So your worship, um, in the absence of not knowing how um, how that's going to work. I'm going to have to uh, oppose this report.
if there was a way uh, to accommodate that uh, phone that were where the staff would be looking to 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 say the user pay I would be supportive to this report but in the absence of that I would be opposed to this report to I think it's appropriate that you vote against the report because the report already considered that option and decided against it in committee so I think the appropriate way for you to deal with it is to vote against it. Um, Councillor Calendino. No. Oh, thank you. I thought Councillor Johnston was ahead of me. Uh, I actually am in support of uh, Councillor Dollywell's uh, argument uh, regarding the pay by phone and the transaction fee. Um, it is, after all, an option that's given to them, and if the customer is not willing to pay the transaction fee, then they can always put a coin in the meter and they don't have to pay that. So I, I'm, I think that uh, every time we use a service, we have to pay for a service anyway. And as Councillor Dallow pointed out, if we go to the bank machine, there is a service charge and we absorb, the client absorbs the, the service charge. And if we do any other service, we always have to pay for that service. I don't think it is uh, necessary for the city to actually have to absorb the transaction fee for the pay by phone service at uh, parking meters. Um, the increase may be argued, but I think it's a fair increase considering all other cities pay more or less or charge more or less the same fee that the city is about to increase to. So uh, I, I, uh, I, I think that uh, we can uh, go ahead with the plan, but uh, staff can obviously uh, investigate that the transaction fee be on, uh, uh, absorbed by the, 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 uh, the client. And, and perhaps uh, since some clients renew uh, because they stay longer than maybe sometimes they expect whether a renewal needs to have to be charged as well or the one transaction fee can remain for the duration of that customer being at that parking meter. Okay, thank you, Councillor Calandino. Councillor Jordan. Uh, thank you, Worship. I uh, appreciate the concerns that my uh, colleagues have uh, brought forward. And the, <coughs> the reason this report is tabled is because uh, those concerns were raised with the Financial Management Committee and we um, got additional information from staff about the implications of both the additional cost of doing the pay by phone app and also um, the potential to charge different rates around the city. So the, the committee did discuss and, and we're definitely looking at maintaining the rate at, at around Burnaby Hospital in that zone so, uh, so not in, to not increase the cost for people who are, are having to attend to the hospital. And also, I think, as you can see in uh, one of the memos in response to the questions that we did canvas of staff, so you still can pay with quarters. <laughs> it's $2 an hour. You can put in one quarter and get 15 minutes worth of parking and take off. But if you phone, you have to pay a dollar. So that's like four times the minimum, right? <laughs> so, so using the phone service is actually more expensive because the minimum is a dollar. So, so in that respect, the committee feels like you, it balances out the, the extra cost. And also, the experience in other cities has been that, for example, if you go to the parking meter and put in your toonie, um, so you've got an hour, and you leave before the hour is up, someone whips in and gets, you know, the space that you've left behind on the meter. But if it's pay by phone, the meter doesn't tell you that there's any time left on it. So somebody drives in and puts in more money on the meter. So in fact, the city could actually gain money out of that, that meter because two or three people could pay for the same amount of time. So, so the, that's the experience um, that other cities that have, have gone to the pay by phone have had. And so I think it's very reasonable that, that the committee have a look at this after it's been in place for a year and balance out and see whether or not you know, we're recovering those costs and then I'm sure we'd be pleased to look again and say, oh, if we're not uh, recovering additional costs of what the program offers, then put, 
the option about a, a sur having a surcharge is always there because I don't want to be subsidizing this either. But I think we should give the program a chance to see what, if indeed it does turn out that we do take in additional revenues and enough to cover the cost of the program. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Just this one last comment, Your Worship. Uh, people that will pay by the uh, pay by phone app will find will get a reminder notice prior to their parking expiring. So if they are, in fact, going to take longer than what they bought the parking time for, they'll be reminded and encouraged to uh, actually buy more time. So in fact, that will actually addition, add additional revenue to the city. In the in the fact that sometimes there's people sitting with expired meters and we can't have uh, um, ins bylaw inspectors in every, in every meter. So the fact that there's the reminder that the meter is expiring, we're actually going to, I think, make some additional revenue. And I'd like to have less tickets, which is always good. Exactly. Because I, tickets are never a pleasant experience for the city. Uh, people aren't. think it's... Uh, revenue generation, but we'd really prefer that they simply paid the money. Oh, later. you bet. You bet. Um, I have Councillor, oh, no other Councillor, oh, Councillor <laughs> Wang. Yeah, I uh, support this uh, recommendations. I uh, even use this uh, uh, pay by phone uh, in Vancouver, it's all the way back to 10 years ago, which is very, very convenient. So I'm so surprised, you know, in, uh, in Burnaby, we haven't used uh, this pay by phone so far. It's kind of uh, strange to me. So I think it's uh, technology bring a lot of uh, convenience. Now the people use the apps, you know, which is more convenience, you know, just like uh, uh, they mentioned about, uh, you know, they can remind you and you can do it very quickly and you can add the more money. Just uh, whatever you are, you know, you can just do this uh, through the phone. So I think technology, we cannot uh, reject this, you know, I fully uh, support this, uh, this recommendation. Thank you, and uh, I will note uh, on the first item that staff have the ability to be able to uh, to set the rates right down to a block if they choose to do so. So uh, they'll be able to look at where the rates should appropriately be set at the maximum and where there may be a, a lesser rate, and I'm sure they'll exercise good judgment in that regard. But certainly the committee has indicated that around Burnaby Hospital is an area where we should look at maintaining the existing rates. All right, uh, are you ready for the question? All those in favor? Opposed? And we have Councillors Volko, Calendino, and uh, Dollywall opposed. The uh, motion passes. All right, and with that, um, moving on to bylaws, Councillor Volko. And for first, second, and third reading, I would move that bylaws numbered 13610, 13611, 13612, and 13613 be now introduced and read three times. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, opposed, and carried. For third reading, reconsideration and final adoption, I would move that bylaw numbered 13148 be now read a third time, reconsidered, finally adopted, signed by the mayor and clerk, and the corporate seal affixed thereto. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. And for reconsideration and final adoption, I would move that bylaws numbered 13343, 13471, 13608, 13609 be now reconsidered, finally adopted, signed by the mayor and clerk, and the corporate seal affixed thereto. And moved and seconded. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, opposed, and carried. All right, uh, are there any inquiries or new business? Councillor Jordan. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. In the, in the purple pages, the very, the very last one, uh, item J, I think it is, oh, item I. Uh, a lady who says she's a building manager at a, a Cassie Avenue uh, rental building, and, and I wonder if I uh, could have staff follow up with her. She, she's she says that there's something strange going on in the neighborhood. They've had so many applications for rentals in their area, but she doesn't kind of give much other information about it. And I, I'd like to find out, like, what's she getting at? <laughs> oh. 
So if you could just sort of follow along, follow up with her and see well, what Well, why don't you refer it to the uh, Community Development Committee? I was wondering, but we're, we just canceled our meeting tomorrow, so I'm just could, if they could just go I'll back to I'll ask staff her. To, uh, to make contact and then report back to your next meeting. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. All right. All right. Uh, is there anything else? Seeing nothing, all those out, oh, we're ready for a motion to adjourn. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Thank you very much. And no meeting next week is a, the FCM is on.